to. Hello, I'm Andy Munn. I'm the pastor of Walnut Hill. And if you were watching our online service on Sunday, August 22nd, you will know that about 10 minutes into the sermon, our video cut out. So um, I'm going to splice together what was preached on the 22nd and then finish the sermon here. So I uh, apologize for the inconvenience, but at least we have the technology to be able to do this as we are working through our series of God's design for human sexuality. I'd invite you to turn to Romans chapter 1 as we continue this short series, which is becoming a longer series than what I envisioned. Um, as we look at God's design for human sexuality throughout the scriptures. Um, <clears throat> A couple years, or I guess it was about six years ago, we did a, a study just a couple of weeks. And uh, quite frankly, as I left the study, I thought, okay, this is good. We, this is what we need to know about particularly the Bible and homosexuality. Um, and it was, it was good biblical information. I'm not saying the sermons were good, by the way. I'm just saying <laughs> that the, the information, because it was from the Scriptures, was good and we could intellectually walk away and say, okay, that's what the Bible says. I want us to take some time to understand that there's something in all of us that has deep problems. <laughs> and it's easy to point to a particular area of sin that's identified in the Bible as sin and say, ah, see, that's wrong. And not also place ourselves in the story of God's redeeming love. By story, I don't mean a fake story, I mean the true story of what God has done for us in Christ. Over the last couple of weeks, I've tried to use some illustrations. One was the pottery that my friend Tim Sawyer made and that uh, he made it with a particular intent. The, the communion plate and chalice um, is to be just that, a communion plate and chalice. And, and this this little picture that he made with his own hands was designed to be a, a, probably something to have cream in it for coffee or tea. And last week we talked about if we took these things and, and used them in ways that he hadn't designed, if we'd use these in my garage to pour oil into my car and, and empty an oil pan into the plate or try to use that chalice as a, a jack stand, not only would it break those things, but it's not what Tim designed them to be. And I asked you the question, what would you think if I did that? And you were like, oh, you think I was crazy. And then I asked the better question, which is, what would Tim think? It's not what he designed them to be. We talked about how as God's image bearers, we reflect something of his glory, but because sin has, we have brought sin into the picture, we have, we have broken that image. We are a shattered, marred uh, uh, reflection of who God is. We still reflect Him, but we also are born in sin. And so there's something fatally flawed in each of us. And so now we come to Romans chapter 1, which is a challenging passage for every single one of us. I'd like you to stand, if you're able, as we read God's Word. We stand now in honor of God who has given us His holy, inspired, and errant Word. I'm going to begin reading at verse 18 and continue through verse 31, 32. Hear the Word of the Lord. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him because they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, 
because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Father, we come to this, your holy word, and we ask that you would make it sweeter than the drippings of the honeycomb. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. In her recent book, Another Gospel, Alyssa Childers tells the story of how she was building Legos, a Lego dragon with her children. She uh, was wanting to just do something with them and uh, uh, she's kind of a, a geeky parent, she says, as, as she kind of makes her kids listen to all kinds of audio books and podcasts and things like that, rather than just, you know, watching uh, Paw Patrol or, or other things. And so one of the things that she likes to do for fun with them is to play with Legos. And many of you know that Legos, beyond being um, this, this wonderful thing, can also be a deadly instrument, at least for your feet, When your kids are young, as you try to walk through the minefield of Legos that are on the floor, she is talking about how they built this incredible Lego dragon. It took a lot of time. They put it on her daughter's dresser. And within about a week, they came into her daughter's room, and the dragon had fallen on the floor. Now, you know what happens when Lego things fall on the floor, right? (laughs) Lots of different pieces. And so she goes on and she says, I'm not really sure if it was one of the animals or if it was a little brother or maybe some magical elves that went into the room and knocked the dragon over. Whatever the case, the dragon was broken. And so they went back to the directions and they realized that they had missed two key pages that would have strengthened the middle of the dragon. This passage is a key foundation for God's truth in the world. It's the kind of passage that if we ignore it, the foundation can crumble. That what we see in the scriptures, we could maybe try to take another way. Because at this point in the Bible, we see how pointed and specific the Bible gets. We see what we read in 2 Timothy 3.16, that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, even dividing bone and marrow. Sometimes we hear that verse and we think, yes, it's the sword of the Spirit. And we like, you know, we put swords on our Bibles and we, kids are running around with the sword of the Spirit. You know, that's the Word of God, by the way. And we fail to see that scripture is saying it penetrates through to our hearts, to our motives, to who we are. The Word of God pierces us. This is one of those passages. It's uncomfortable. It doesn't fit us the way we, it doesn't fit into our lives the way that we would want it to. Because it talks about and reveals our brokenness. But to understand our brokenness, And also to understand the hope of the gospel, we have to understand God's wrath and our will. I wasn't feeling particularly creative with a sermon title this week, so my sermon title is the three points for the sermon. (laughs) God's wrath, our will, and the way of hope. 
God's wrath, our will, and the way of hope. God's wrath. Verse 18. This is the verse that anchors this whole section. I'll be honest, I hadn't really thought about it that way before. I hadn't seen it that way until I was reading uh, in uh, one of the, the little commentaries that Tim Keller had written, and then others corroborated, that this is the driving focus, the wrath of God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And then later on in the verse it says, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. There are two things going on. The wrath of God against our unrighteousness and the suppressing of the truth through our unrighteousness. But we want to talk about the wrath of God. And first of all, I want us to understand the passive wrath of God. We think of the active wrath of God when we think of the wrath of God, right? At least I do. And I think you do too. We think about, rightly, the wrath of God being poured out on Jesus Christ because of our sin. That that is right for us to think about that. But the Apostle Paul is writing to us using an unusual expression to describe the wrath of God. And he says it three times. In verse 24, in verse 26, and in verse 28. He says, God gave them up in or God gave them up to. And these are descriptions of how God is revealing the wrath of God to us. It's sort of this passive revealing of God's wrath. It says, God gave them up in the lust of of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. For this reason, reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Verse 28, God gave them up to a debased mind. What's going on here? Part of God's wrath toward our sin is His withdrawal of Himself. Of His withholding of His love. We actually see that in the repercussions of the fall. We quickly in Genesis 3 say, oh, this is God's curse on sin. That may not be the best way to describe it, I get what we're trying to say. I don't think it's like, don't go away and say, well, Pastor Andy said it's not a curse. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it may not be the best description in terms of our understanding unless we can understand it this way, that when we see what God had cursed Adam and Eve with, a large measure of it is giving them what they already showed they wanted, but giving it to them to the full. What did Eve want? (laughs) Well, part of it, not all of it, she wanted to do things on her own, apart from her husband. God had made them one. She was listening to the serpent. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, apart from God's design. What was her curse? You're going to be, you're going to want your, your, your desire is going to be for your husband. That means your desire is going to be for his place, for his role, over, above what you even did here. I'm giving you what you want. We see what God did with the people of Israel when they were wanting a king like all the other nation's kings. In 1 Samuel, we read how God through Samuel warned them, if you have a king like all the other nation's kings, this is what that king is going to be like. He's going to take things from you, things that are important. It's going to be a painful existence for you. And even in the face of the truth, what did Israel say? We want that king. We want a king just like everybody else's kings. And what did God do? He gave them what they, as mentioned in the sermon from the 22nd, there are many, many times in the scripture when when the Lord actually gives us what we want to show us what we need. It reminds me of a story that I've heard told many times before. The story of a grandfather who finds his grandson smoking a cigarette. This you know, 12-year-old grandson who's found a pack of cigarettes and thought, man, it's going to be the coolest thing ever to smoke these cigarettes. And so what does the grandfather do? He says, come on over here, have a seat. Let's the boy finish one cigarette, hands him another. And this, this 12-year-old boy is thinking, I've got the coolest grandpa ever. He's letting me smoke. This is just awesome. After the second, he hands him a third. And then by that point, the little boy is probably turning green and doesn't want to admit that he's not feeling so great. And the 
grandfather just gives him another one. And why does he do this? He gives him all of these cigarettes so that hopefully he'll learn that this is not what he really wants, what he really needs, even though he thinks it's what he wants right now. He gives him what he wants to show him what he really doesn't need. And in many ways, that's what we see in this passage in Romans 1, when God gave them up to or gave them over to these things. He gave them over to three things, to pursue the over-desires of their hearts to impurity. They were dishonoring their bodies among themselves, it says. And, and that means at least and not less than sexual sin. But it also may be tied up with pagan worship. But it's, but it's not just that. If you look at the way the, the Scriptures are, and we'll see it here in a few moments, it's at least sexual sin. He also gave them over to pursue dishonorable passions, and it's very clear in the context of the passage that, that what the Word is showing us is that it's, it's homosexuality that is the problem. And the third thing that the Lord gave us over to in this passive wrath is He, he gave us over to live by debased minds. And when we talk about the wrath of God, we do have to understand that it has a context. The context of the wrath of God is, is not that we are completely ignorant, but the passage is very clear that God can be known. That we can know Him by, by the nature around us. We can see His creation and we can testify to the fact that there's a Creator. And so we're not without excuse for not seeking the true God. Verse 21 summarizes succinctly, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Paul's argument throughout this section of the passage is that we have the ability to know God, to know His design for life, to know His truth according to His Word. And we're not just ignorant, but there's a willful ignorance. And that actually gives us culpability for what we don't know. Because we're rejecting it. And we suppress the truth with our unrighteousness. And it's very easy to look at the passage and says, well, it says they and them, but we have to see that it really is we and us as well. This is our story too. Tim Keller writes in, in his little commentary series, Romans for You, we all know, regardless of what we tell ourselves, that there is a Creator on whom we are utterly dependent and to whom we are completely accountable. We cannot know everything about God from creation, His love and mercy, for instance, but we can and do deduce that whoever created all this must be a being of unimaginable greatness. And then we suppress that truth. Our unrighteousness suppresses the truth. It says that in verse 18 as we just read. Living apart from God's design, living apart from the truth of the gospel, living apart from Jesus Christ is how we suppress the truth. We think that we want a life free from restrictions, free from rules, free from God, free from oversight. And in reality, when we live that life of so-called freedom, we are actually living in unrighteousness that suppresses the truth. God gives us what we want to show us what we need. That's His pattern throughout the Scriptures. It's certainly not His blessing upon sin. In fact, there have been many who have said that if you look at the Old Testament, why didn't God say anything about you know, having multiple wives or about this thing or that thing, these horrible things that go on? Why did He not do, do anything about it and, and as if He condones it? And that's not the case. He doesn't condone sin ever. But instead, He gave us up or over to these things. It's 
as I've mentioned, sort of this, this idea of, of his passive wrath toward us. Whether it's to Adam and Eve or to Israel when they want a king, God is showing us what living a life apart from him is like. And it's not a good life. God regularly gives us what we want to show us what we need, to show us the futility of pursuing life on our own apart from Him. To reveal to us our need for Him to intervene. So what do we do with God's willful, excuse me, wrathful withdrawal? And that gets to the, the, the subject of our will. And we see that with the will of man, we have three exchanges in this passage that sort of parallel these three, uh, these three instances of God giving us over to. And the first exchange we see is that we exchange God's glory for something far less. Look at verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Claiming to wise, claiming to be wise, they became fools. But what is their wisdom based on? It's based on I, on me. I'm now the center of wisdom for life. And while certainly Paul is talking about pagan worship with idols and things like that, things that we don't really relate to today, we we do relate to the idea, though, of bowing down before things that are creaturely, such as ourselves, pursuing our own passions, the things that we want. You see, what, what these two verses are telling us is that we reject God and we exchange God's glory for something else. And, and really, what it comes down to is we exchange His glory for our own because we're trying to pursue life on our own. We're trying to go by our own wisdom, claiming to be wise, they became fools. There's even something in the language here that Paul may be alluding to the fact, as, as we saw with the mirrors, that we are reflecting something of who God is. We're reflecting something of His glory, but we're exchanging His glory for something else. We're reflecting the glory of something else. And I just wonder if there's an intent there with Paul to, to kind, of, kind of hone in on the fact that we are image bearers of God. And we're rejecting that design for our lives. But whatever the case, it's based on our so-called wisdom that we create our own idols. As John Calvin wrote and famously wrote, our hearts are idol-making factories. We'll, We'll bow down before anything except for God. The second exchange that we see is the, the exchange of the truth of God for a lie. Verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. These verses are pointing to a reality that every human is made to worship. We're going to worship something. But God gave us up in the lusts of our hearts. (laughs) We exchanged the truth of God for a lie. The lie that something else can be worshipped. There's even this tie-in with the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, which is tied to, to pagan worship, but it's also in a phrase that's by itself. <laughs> so it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to that pagan worship. We dishonor our bodies, our hearts are prone to impurity. We're running after it, which means at very least, as I mentioned before, Sexual immorality, it's not limited to that, but it at least means that too. But what we're doing again and again is we're removing God from creation. 
and acting as if he's not even there. We're removing him. We are removing him from the from everything. And even elevating creation to the point where there's no need for God. And this is a lie. We're exchanging the truth of God for a lie. Worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. In our proud wisdom, we reject God's wisdom, His design, and His order. There's a third exchange that we see. We exchange natural relations for those contrary to nature. Look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. We, we can't get around this passage. It's very clear that it's talking about homosexual relationships between women and women and men with men. In recent years, there have been attempts to try to re-explain what this passage means. Playing on these words natural and unnatural, or natural and contrary to nature, or natural and against nature, depending on how you translate that. Uh, and and the, the idea, the, the argument is that, that these unnatural relationships are the Relationships that are not monogamous, loving relationships. But natural would be, you know, something that is, that love is central, that monogamy is central. And so it's not really, a, it's not really saying that, that there's a problem with homosexual relationships as long as they are monogamous and loving. And that that would be the natural versus unnatural. But as Sam Alberry writes in his little book, Is God Anti-Gay? Sam Alberry, who himself has, has, <clears throat> has expressed that he has same-sex attraction and struggles with it. He's a Christian who is um, not succumbing to those desires, surrendered those to Christ. He sees them as sinful desires that need to be mortified. He's an, an Anglican minister. And he writes this, and he writes this with, with everything to lose. <laughs> he says, the words natural and against nature do not describe our subjective experience of what feels natural to us, but instead refer to the fixed way of things in creation. The nature that Paul says homosexual behavior contradicts is God's purpose for us, revealed in creation and reiterated throughout Scripture. Do you hear what Alberry is saying? He's saying that when it talks about against nature, it's, it's against God's design. It's not the way God intended it to be or wants it to be, and therefore it is sinful. John Stott, uh, in his little book, Same-Sex Relationships, it's actually a reprint of a chapter from a book called, uh, I think it's just called Issues or Contemporary Issues, um, and so when they republish just that one chapter on same-sex relationships, there's, a, there's an editor's note. And the editor tells us that even E.P. Sanders, who, as the, uh, the editor notes, E.P. Sanders himself explicitly states that he supports the liberal attitude toward homosexuals. In other words, he's okay with homosexuality, all right? And E.P. Sanders, this, this New Testament scholar, writes... Paul's own view of homosexual activities in Romans 1 is a completely unambiguous condemnation of all homosexual activity. Even someone who says he's for homosexuality says you can't get around Romans 1. We would agree with him there. You can't get around Romans 1. It is a completely unambiguous condemnation of all homosexual activity. Now, E.P. Sanders and others will try to say, well, Paul just didn't understand the cultural context. Our cultural context, I should say. His cultural context was different than ours. He didn't understand the idea of, of long-term committed monogamous relationships that were, were focused on, on genuine love for one another. So what about that cultural context? 
Tim Keller writes, in, again, in that little book, Romans for You, he says, recently many have, su- have attempted to suggest that the, tr- the traditional understanding of these verses is mistaken, that this refers to people who act against their own nature, or that it refers only to promiscuous homosexual sex and not to long-term settled relationships. But unnatural relations is literally against nature. That's what the word means. This means that homosexuality is a violation of the created nature God gave us, and there's nothing here to suggest that Paul has only some kinds of homosexual acts in mind. As a cultured and traveled Roman citizen, Paul would have been familiar with long-term, stable, loving relationships between same-sex couples. That does not stop him from identifying them as not the Creator's intent for human flourishing. It'd be easy to read Keller's words and say, well, do you have any evidence? And Greg Johnson, in his forthcoming book, Still Time to Care, What We Can Learn from the Church's Failed Attempt to Cure Homosexuality, writes about the cultural context of the Roman world in Paul's day. And again, Greg Johnson, who is a PCA pastor, who has has let people know that he struggles with same-sex attraction, but he sees it as a sinful desire that he mortifies every day. He, he's written this book to help us understand how can we care for and love those who struggle with homosexuality. And he has something to lose here because he talks about the cultural context that Paul knew in the Roman world. And this is what he writes. During Paul's life as a Pharisee, the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria lamented the prevalence of long-term homosexual relationships among Greeks and worried the human race would have been extinguished had such unions become too common. In the year 64, Nero married his first husband, Pythagoras, in a ceremony described by Tacitus as having all the forms of regular wedlock. The bridal veil was put over the emperor. People saw the witnesses of the ceremony. The wedding dower, the couch, and nuptial torches, everything in a word, was plainly visible. Suetonius also records the marriage, though he misidentifies the name of Nero's husband. It was the talk of the empire. Paul was in Rome at the time. The historical context of Paul's writing is not culturally bound to his moment where he just didn't understand what was going on in terms of loving, long-term homosexual relationships. He would have understood it. It was something that was an accepted practice in his day. And yet he still writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that there's something wrong. We've given up God's design for love, for relationships, for sexuality. Kevin DeYoung writes, homosexual behavior is sin, not according to who practices it or by what motivation they seek it, but because the act itself as a truth-suppressing exchange is contrary to God's design. Now, it would be very easy to take all of these things that, that we've looked at and sort of put them as bullets uh, you know, in our arsenal and say, aha, well, I've got this and I've got that. And we have to be very careful, friends, because while these things are all true, and it does lead us to the truth of God's design and the truth of God's Word, and it promotes holiness rather than sinful living, we have to see that Paul goes on to sum up the rest of our will. Not only did we have these exchanges... But in verse 28, we read, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, 
Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Do you recognize yourself in this list anywhere? Certainly, the sin of homosexuality is highlighted in this section. But then we see how corrupt our hearts are. We see sins of the mouth, sins of the heart, sins of the body. And when we go to Romans 2, just in case we might get too self-righteous and say, yeah, look at them. When we go to Romans 2, Paul says, and by the way, this is you too. This is us. This is our story. This is who we are apart from Christ. You see, in summary, when we think about our will, we make catastrophic exchanges because our hearts want what they want. So is there any hope? The way of hope is the context of the wrath of God. The wrath of God is not the context itself. The context is the gospel. We can't forget that Romans 1.18 comes within the context of the driving principle of the whole book of Romans. Romans 1.15 so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The wrath of God must be seen through the gospel. The, the gospel is what we need. We need Jesus. While God did give us up to these things, that's not all that He gave us. He also gave us His only begotten Son who would take the full wrath of God on Himself for our sin. So that by faith in Him, we will now have His righteousness as He takes our sin. And then He gives us His Holy Spirit who indwells us, who is making us more and more like Jesus every day. Who is showing us through God's Word what holiness looks like. So that we can say no to sin and yes to righteousness. Jesus gave Himself for us. In Galatians 2.20, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. The way of hope is the gospel. The gospel doesn't say we're going to get it all right. But it says that Jesus, the righteous one, died for us. And as we live in Him, we die to self. Pick up our cross every day and follow Him. I wonder... What have you died to? Can you say, I have been crucified with Christ? It's easy to put off things that are comfortable for us to put off and maybe say we've died to those things. But have we died to the things that the Spirit has convicted us of that we need to put away? When I read and listen to things from Sam Alberry, Greg Johnson, Rachel Gilson, Wesley Hill, Jackie Hill Perry, Rosaria Butterfield, I see people 
who have died to their same-sex attraction so that they can live to Christ. They're not heroes. They would say, all of them would say, they're nothing special. But they're brothers and sisters in Christ who can show us what it means to die to something that's hard to die to and to live to Christ. And Jesus is worth it. Jesus calls us to himself. He has died for our sin. He's died for our unrighteousness. He took the full wrath of God for you and me. And his gift to us is free, even though it costs us everything. Our entire lives that we give back in worship to him. Father, we pray that you would take these things and drive them deep into our hearts. Show us where you are convicting us to die to our sin and live to you, to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.